Hi there and welcome to PhD at Living. I have now spent a not insignificant portion of my life failing to get chemistry to work. Countless futile experiments, countless hours at the bench, countless flasks cleaned and countless vials thrown away, and countless gallons of solvent dumped into waste jugs. By the way, I am really sorry about all that, planet Earth. And for what? A graduate degree that basically demonstrates how you can work really hard for six years and get very few legitimate scientific results from all that effort. But then there are the chemists who become wildly successful and wealthy by nothing more than sheer accident. Which brings us to our topic for today, William Henry Perkin and Mavin. In 1856, the 18-year-old Perkin was trying to synthesize quinine, an anti-malarial drug. He instead, as the story goes, worked up one failed batch of quinine and observed an insanely purple color in parts of it. After some investigation, that stuff was isolated and became Mavin, the very first synthetic organic dye and the start of the entire artificial dye industry. For his part, Perkin marketed Mavine well and became a wealthy man. He also invented some other dyes and even has a reaction named after him too, so he wasn't exactly a one-trick pony either. But that's not the whole story. Mavine has another piece of serendipity attached to it. Sometimes the thing you think you're adding to your reaction vessel is not the only thing coming for the ride. No, there are stowaways on board called impurities, and sometimes those impurities make all the difference. For instance, plutonium-240 impurities and plutonium-239 completely wrecked the Thin Man bomb design during the Manhattan Project. More relevant to our synthetic purposes, however, is the all-important classified fog bank material, which, as far as we lay people can tell, is used in almost all American thermonuclear weapons. When the country had exhausted its supply of fog bank and scientists went to resynthesize it, they discovered they couldn't. You know why? Well, in the time between it was made originally and then, one of the reagents became too pure. Too pure! Can you believe it? This is all still double secret classified, so exact molecules aren't known, but are assumed to be polystyrene-ish. There is an impurity in one of the materials that made the entire synthesis work. And this took literally years to figure out. Now when fog banks made, the impurity, you know, the thing you don't want, is selectively added because Chemistry is a fickle mistress with a deviously cruel sense of humor. It's at this point you may be asking yourself, Devin, where the hell are you going with all this? You mean, aside from bemoaning my complete lack of serendipitous good fortune in chemistry? Yeah, okay, this is a collaborative video with Adrian over at Adrian's Chemistry Laboratory. I don't campaign for myself, but please do go check out his channel and give it a like or subscribe if you feel so inclined. He mixes far more classical music and sartorial flair than I do around here, and I consider myself a total cretin by comparison. Adrian made some Mavine in a video of his, but unfortunately didn't have a smashing amount of success. He absolutely correctly demonstrated the disgusting black sludge that is the start of all good Mavine work, but the synthetic endpoint was beyond the end of the video. Well, I don't have a lab nearly as good as Adrian's, or William Perkin for that matter. He dialed in the majority of the Mavine synthesis in a home laboratory because he was supposed to be synthesizing quinine and didn't want to get in trouble. So we're doing this on paper. What happened and what could be done to fix it? Let's find out. Folks have been interested for a long time what Perkin did to make Mavine work. If you look at his patent, unfortunately, it laughably, like all patents, leaves out some secret sauce. Perkin, for his part, can be forgiven because he was relatively unaware of his secret sauce's existence. The key to Perkin's mavine is toluidine, specifically orthotoluidine and paratoluidine. Without these two isomers, you don't get the main couple species in mavine. Wait, couple species? Yeah, spoiler alert, mavine's not a discrete compound, so when you say the word mavine, you're not talking about one single molecule. It's actually a mixture of a few different compounds, but that also allows mavine to have a signature based on how it was made and who made it. It's that ability to have a pile of related but not identical compounds that also unfortunately makes mavine synthesis so darn messy. Okay, so what was Perkins' signature? Lucky for us, some Portuguese scientists in Nature figured it out. Link in the description and hat tip to Daniel Matthews for commenting on Adrian's video and bringing the article up. The two main constituents of Perkins mavine soup are these compounds here, mavine A and mavine B. Using our friendly impurities, green orthotoluidine and red paratoluidine, with a little bit of blue aniline splashed in, we can see mavine A has two blue anilines, one green orthotoluidine and one red paratoluidine, while mavine B has two orthotoluidines, one aniline and one paratoluidine. But there are tons of different combinations you can make. If I take these cool building blocks that my kiddos like to play with, you can see that I can make Mavine A 
two aniline molecules, one orthotoluidine impurity and one paratoluidine impurity, or I can just as easily take them and make mavine B. One aniline, two orthotoluidine impurities, and one paratoluidine impurity. Or I can blow them apart entirely and make a brand new mavine, let's say from two paratoluidine impurities, one aniline and one orthotoluidine impurity just slapped on for good measure. This, my friends, is what made elucidating the mechanism of and molecule, that is the product of Perkins mavine, so difficult. I can take my three different molecules, but if I arrange them in different ratios, I'm going to get different stuff. Perkin himself didn't know what levels of orthotoluidine and paratoluidine impurities he had, so how were we supposed to figure it out either? Well, through chemistry, of course. Did you even watch this channel? In reality, through a bunch of fun mass spec identification and chromatographic quantification, our friends on the other side of the Atlantic, or in Adrian's case, the same side of the Atlantic, derived that the ideal ratio for Perkins mavine was twice as much paratoluidine as orthotoluidine and aniline. But Devin, where does the toluidine impurity come from? Great question. In the synthesis of aniline, we typically start with benzene and nitrate to nitrobenzene and then reduce back to the aniline. Unfortunately, benzene usually has a little bit of toluene impurity and chemical reagents not knowing that they should selectively react with only the thing you want them to ends up giving you ortho and para nitrotoluene impurities. Para nitrotoluene, interestingly enough, is the subject of Adrian's most popular video, the polymerizing reaction of this bad boy with sulfuric acid. Do check that one out. At any rate, during the reduction, you take your ortho and para nitrotoluenes and end up getting, you guessed it, ortho and para toluenes. But Devin, why does it direct para and ortho instead of meta? Well, another great question. Turns out this methyl group on the toluene is electron donating, so during electrophilic aromatic substitution, you get resonance structures that are amenable to the ortho and the para substituents. You want to see it? Okay, let's show you. Yeah, I know. I tried telling you, but you wanted to see it. If we start with our two toluenes over here, because there were too many arrows to just have one, you can see I get three main constituents. My orthonitrotoluene, my paranitrotoluene, and my metanitrotoluene. If you then look inside all of the resonance structures that you can get during this substitution, you'll see that there are three meta-substitution resonance structures, and four each for the ortho and the para. This doesn't mean to say that you get no metanitrotoluene or metatoluene in your aniline, it's just saying that probabilistic of the nitrotoluenes and the toluenes that you end up getting to make your mavine, the wide preponderance of them are going to be ortho and para. Cool? Which brings us mercifully to the actual synthesis of mavine, or at least Perkins mavine. The combination of sulfuric acid and potassium dichromate is our first step in mavine synthesis. That is an extremely acidic oxidizing environment that takes our regular aniline and creates a radically cationic aniline. This radical cation then attacks virgin aniline, orthotoluidine, and paratoluidine in whatever given ratios and steps it has to create the various compounds in our mavine soup. Mavine A, mavine B, etc., etc., purple-ish stuff. The exact mechanism, as one would expect from a multi-step aromatic substitution combination bonanza, is fairly intense but not exactly instructive, so I'm not going to show it, but we'll put a link to the paper in the description if and in that's your cup of English breakfast. Even in the best of conditions, ignoring the washing and drying steps and the relatively pure reagents that we have today compared to the messy stuff that Perkin had, and the synthesis of mavine is just really, really bad. On a mole basis, our Portuguese researchers maintained the 1 to 2 to 1 mole ratio of orthotoluidine to paratoluidine to aniline and ended up getting 5.11 times 10 to the negative 6 moles of mavine. Using the molecular weight of mavine A, depending how you calculate it, that percent yield is just about 1%, which is not good for a two-step one-pot synthesis. The byproducts creating a gigantic mess of black tarry sludge is exactly what Adrian demonstrated in his synthesis and is just the way mavine is. That is to say, a very tiny bit of purple in a gigantic mess of black sludge. So, take solace in the fact that you didn't do anything wrong, buddy. That's just how mavine synthesis is. Inefficient and messy. For what it's worth, Adrian pegged exactly what the problem was right in his video. His aniline, ironically, was probably a little too pure and didn't have the necessary orthotoluidine and paratoluidine impurities to make Perkins mavine. Even then, in the best of cases, you'd still need a bunch of washes and extractions to get that clean purple color we all know and love. 
As a final grab bag, let's talk about Perkins graduate advisor, August Wilhelm von Hoffmann. Hoffmann was part of the pair that coined the term synthesis and was a legit organic chemist. He's got two reactions named after him, the Hoffman rearrangement and Hoffman elimination, and he's widely regarded as the first person to use molecular models to describe chemicals. And here I am just using cheap plastic squares. Perkins' boss, Hoffman's boss, was Eustace von Liebig. He was a complete badass and ran one of the best labs in the world in its heyday. He revolutionized chemistry pedagogy by teaching predominantly from the bench and giving his students lots of hands-on experience. He also invented a sick five-bulb device for measuring the CHO content of organic molecules and has a condenser named after him. He also invented part of a silvering process that is still used for mirrors today. In an awesome example of chemical cross-contamination, Liebig, Berzelius, and Wohler jointly coined and sort of got the idea of isomers when Liebig and Wohler synthesized variants of the same molecule that they eventually came to the conclusion were both equally scientifically valid. There's a lot of other rad stuff on his Wikipedia page, but we're about three layers deep now, and I'm pretty sure I see your eyeballs glazing over. And there you have it, folks, the wild, wonderful world of Mavine. And don't forget to check out Adrian's chemistry laboratory, all right? See you next time! Violet! You're turning violet, Violet!